Can the Biden administration's push for climate solutions be executed in an equitable and inclusive way? Climate One's empowering conversations feature all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the exciting and the scary, people who are in power and people who are disempowered. I'm Greg Dalton. Despite the Trump administration's efforts to divide Americans, we actually are united when it comes to wanting a greener way of life. 85% of Americans agree that we would love to see 100% clean energy in this country. 85% of Americans. How many issues do 85% of Americans agree on? Andreas Karelis is founder and executive director of Revolve, an organization that helps nonprofits across the country go solar. He recently authored the book, Climate Courage, How Tackling Climate Change Can Build Community, Transform the Economy, and Bridge the Political Divide in America. In the book, Corellis breaks down how the right conversations about climate change can leave people feeling empowered rather than skeptical or hopeless. If you point someone to the reality of climate change and do not point to the solutions that they can be involved in, that there's nothing that they can do, they are less likely to believe that it is real than if you point out that here is the reality of climate change and here is what you can do about it. Corellis's personal awakening about the importance of climate change took place on the day the Twin Towers fell. My first week of college was also 9-11. I was going to school in Washington, D.C. and my family is from New York. So that was devastating. And it really got me thinking about the globe and the world, global politics in a way that I hadn't really before. I was certainly one of the many activists out in the streets protesting against the war and really looking at this, the war as an oil grab of, you know, the United States government. And I started taking economics classes around energy and the economics of oil and realizing that there were alternatives and that clean energy was a viable option. And, you know, at the time it was viable, but the costs were, you know, obviously way more than they are today. So that really kind of set me up with a passion in clean energy and solving the climate crisis, how can we use clean energy not only to solve the climate crisis, but also to stop inequality, to bring energy to parts of the world where they don't have it? And so that was really kind of the driving force that kind of got me started down the path. How has your thinking about the problem and solutions evolved over time? Yeah. When I graduated from college, I was very passionate about clean energy, and I knew that I wanted to sort of focus on this in my career. and I was also very sort of engaged with the climate movement, uh, going to marches, signing petitions, doing online activism, which you know we would now call clicktivism. And what I found was that, particularly when President Obama was elected, that he ran on a platform of, I'm going to be the president who solves the climate crisis. And those of us who were in the movement were ecstatic, right? It was like, this is it. We're finally going to solve this thing. And as you know, and, and I'm sure many of the listeners know, you know, that didn't happen, right? You know, 2009, we had Marky Waxman. We thought this was going to be this watershed moment. The bill dies in the Senate. You know, later, Obama goes to Copenhagen and doesn't really uh, sort of solve the crisis at the scale that we wanted. And so we basically are kind of back to square one where it's like, wait a minute, we as a climate movement, we marched, we protested, we made our voices heard. And yet the political establishment was unable to deliver. They had their hands tied. And so that really sparked a question for me, which was, okay, if Washington was never to solve the problem, like if their hands are tied such that they can never do anything about this, how might we go about solving the problem, right? Like how might we go about solving the problem without waiting for our elected officials to solve it, right? Assuming that they never come. And so that was really, I think, the big shift for me. And that really got me down this path of, okay, well, where do solutions lie? If it's not at the top, and I am very much a fan of people taking individual personal actions um, for the message that that sends to the world, I don't think that the solutions lie at the individual level, right? And so that really brought me to this point where, okay, I think the solutions lie at the community level. At the community level, we can take action with each other. We can create sort of real impacts that we can see and that we can feel and that can sort of create movements. 
You write about speaking to uh, people of faith, conservatives. So someone who wants to reach a person of faith, you know, to use a certain language or uh, have a conversation, <laughs> heaven forbid, these days with conservative about climate. How should one do that? Speak to uh, meet people where they are and listen and what language should they use? Yes. No, this is really the crux of the question, right? This is the fundamental issue. And you know, this is where I really turn to Catherine Hayhoe, who, you know, wrote the forward of the book and her message for years has been the most important thing we can do about climate change is just talk about it, that the vast majority of Americans report that they never talk about climate change. So how can we expect the populace to sort of really rally behind this issue and our politicians to take action on it if we're not even talking about it? So that to me is, okay, that's the issue that we need to be focusing on. And Catherine also has a tremendous amount of insight that she's shared around how you do that. And, and, you know, what she describes and what I write about in the book is connecting the dots between what people already care about and how that is tied to climate change. So, you know, you mentioned faith. I have a chapter on faith communities in the book that are doing incredible work from Sally Bingham and the Interfaith Power and Light to Ambrose Carroll and Green the Church to Huda Alkoff with Wisconsin Green Muslims. And the list goes on and on. And there are incredible ways that we've seen and that I highlight in the book from each faith where people are reaching into their own values of that faith. What is it that this faith holds to be important or sacred, or what is our responsibility to care for the earth or, or steward creation, and then tying that to how they can get involved in protecting the planet. And we're seeing more, even evangelical groups are taking action. Catherine is one of the, uh, you know, kind of leading advisors to many of these evangelical climate groups. So I think that there's a lot more momentum. There's a lot of examples of how we do that. And really, at, at the end of the day, it boils down to how do you listen as opposed to tell, right? Like we're not walking into a community and saying, let me show you, you know, all these horrible things that are happening around the climate and telling people what they should be doing. Instead, it's how do you connect to your local environment? Let's say you are a uh, an outdoors person, you are a, a fisherman, you know, how have the fish population been affected by the changing climate? Are you a farmer? How has your crops been affected by the change in climate? Do you recognize the change in climate? And they do. They absolutely do, right? Especially folks who have been, you know, have their hands in the land. They know that the climate is changing. So that's where you start, right? Is like, what are points of mutual interest? Do you care about nature? Do you care about clean water, clean air for your grandchildren, right? Like these are the kinds of things that, that people can say, yes, I agree with you on this. Yes, I agree with you on this. Okay, how about clean energy. Well, guess what? Clean energy, 85% of Americans agree that we would love to see 100% clean energy in this country. 85% of Americans. How many issues, Greg, do 85% of Americans agree on, right? I can't think of any others, you know, but clean energy is there. So that's a really a, an important point of commonality that we have with everyone. You write that a sense of progress is really important. Uh, does that sense of progress have a meaningful impact other than making us feel better and more powerful? Because people often say like, you know, I want to change, but I want to make sure that my change matters. Yeah. Yeah. No, abs absolutely. It does. I mean, look, if you're trying to lose weight, right, and you start dieting and you start exercising and, you know, you're trying it for, you know, the first week, the second week, the third week, not only have you not lost any weight, maybe you put on a pound or two and you're thinking, what gives, you know, what am I doing here? You're easily going to give up, right? You're going to sit back on the couch and pop open the chips, right? Like that's how our brain works. Whereas if you are seeing progress, if you're able to stick with it long enough to see progress, or if you are told ahead of time, look, sometimes if you're trying to lose weight, it might not, you might not see some progress in the first few weeks. But if you wait a month or two months and you stick with it, you're going to see the progress. Once you get a little bit of progress, well, then all of a sudden you feel in control. You feel that this is part of your ability to make a change in the world. You feel empowered and you feel that you have a sense of agency. And this, in my opinion, is absolutely critical, right? Like this is the difference that, in fact, many of the studies show, I talk about this in the book, that scientists were sort of researching and surveying Americans. 
and basically saying that if you point someone to the reality of climate change and do not point to the solutions that they can be involved in, that there's nothing that they can do, they are less likely to believe that it is real than if you point out that here is the reality of climate change and here is what you can do about it, right? It seems counterintuitive how the human brain works, but if we see that there's a problem and we know that there's a solution that we can use to solve the problem, we're more likely to believe that the problem exists. Whereas if there's no solution, our brain is literally sort of built to be able to say, well, I'm just going to forget about that and pretend it's not a problem. Andreas Corellis is author of the new book, Climate Courage, How Tackling Climate Change Can Build Community, Transform the Economy, and Bridge the Political Divide in America. It's an excellent synthesis of a lot of different uh, thinking on different dimensions of climate change. Um, you write about the mere exposure effect and how it's how is that relevant to the spread of solar and other modes of clean energy? Uh, yeah, this is actually, I think, our secret weapon in the fight against climate change. Because what the studies show is that solar in energy in particular has this contagious effect or this viral effect, this network effect, where when one person goes solar, their neighbor and their neighbor are more likely to go solar. And the same is true, you know, if you look back at the Prius or the Tesla, and really just making it more commonplace, right? That when somebody sees it, okay, you know, my neighbor did this, they're saving money, I want to do this too. This is part of who I am. This is part of my community. And actually, the study, uh, most recent study uh, that came out of Tufts and UC Berkeley about disparities of solar according to race found that this effect, this sort of seeding effect or this feedback loop of solar actually has a more impactful impact in communities of color, and it's almost twice as powerful in African-American communities. So it's, it's one of the things that we talk about in that, you know, the solar industry in particular, you know, needs to address, needs to be spend more time, and, and the climate movement in general, how is it that we make, you know, this is obviously something that Van Jones was the spokesperson for. How is it that we make sure that the green wave lifts all boats? How do we make sure that these technologies are not isolated to privileged communities, but that everybody has access to the technology and the benefits that clean energy and solving climate change can have. And so, yeah, there's a lot that we can do there to improve that situation. And the math is getting even more favorable for people who put rooftop on their solar for their home or their company because with the wildfires and Californians are still paying for an electric uh, deregulation debacle nearly 20 years ago. The people in Texas are going to be paying for their you know, market-based power for a very long time. If you have your own energy on your rooftop, you're insulated from those rising costs. Tell us quickly, your company is a revolving community solar fund. Tell us what that does. Absolutely. So I started a nonprofit called Revolve 10 years ago. Actually, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary. And what Revolve does is it's identified a problem, which is that nonprofit organizations at the community level in particular face a very steep barrier to going solar. They really can't get their solar projects financed the same way you could if you were a homeowner or a business owner. There are particular barriers that prohibit them from going solar. And so Revolve started out as a crowdfunding platform where we were raising money through crowdfunding donations that went into paying for each solar project for uh, community-based nonprofits across the country, which then would pay us back over time and seed a revolving fund that we call the Solar Seed Fund, helping the next nonprofit and the next nonprofit go solar, all the while holding education and community engagement events so that we can really take advantage of that ripple effect of solar so that each nonprofit that goes solar can then plant a seed in the community and get those community members to go solar and to take political action around clean energy and climate change. And yeah, I'm proud to say that at this point, we've deployed over $10 million of solar for 43 nonprofits in 10 states. We're saving them $17 million on their electric bills that they are using to put back into their mission of serving the homeless, the hungry, providing after-school programs and the like. It's a very exciting time for us, and we continue to grow, particularly through our solar ambassador program, as I mentioned, which is college uh, students who, um, as well as uh, working professionals, people of all ages, but mostly college students who sign up as volunteers through our solar ambassador program. And we basically train them on how to go into their community and spearhead these nonprofit solar energy projects. And many of which I'm proud to say have gone on to work in the clean energy industry after they graduate. Andreas Corellis, thanks for coming on Climate One. Thank you so much for having me. It's a huge honor. 
This is Climate One, and we're talking about how to make the shift to a green economy inclusive and open to all. Coming up, how a precocious preteen became CEO of a leading environmental corporation. My little fourth grader image of a scientist was an old white man. And so I borrowed one of my dad's white shirts and I made this beard out of cotton balls and I gave a presentation to my entire school about climate change. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. An equitable transition away from fossil fuels isn't just about solar panels and green jobs in low-income neighborhoods. The emerging clean energy economy has to look different all the way up to the top. There are a lot of women founders of startup companies, but we do not get the funding that we need. Sandra Kwok is one woman who beat the odds. She's the CEO and founder of 10 Power, which helps people access and pay for energy in Haiti and other developing countries. We need to create some climate bonds that are going to allow us to finance this clean energy infrastructure in the communities that we care about. Vulnerable, historically disenfranchised communities need to own the climate infrastructure that gets installed in their communities. Not only do they get the jobs, not only do they get the financial returns, but they need to have ownership stakes in this infrastructure as it rolls out. Danelle Baird is the founder and CEO of Block Power, a climate technology startup based in Brooklyn. They help buildings with high energy usage in financially underserved communities become more efficient. That's something he learned about the hard way growing up. We did not have a functioning energy system for heating and cooling in my home. We lived in a townhouse in Brooklyn with a bunch of other families. We like shared a bathroom with a bunch of other families on our floor. And so we didn't have a functioning heating system. So we used our oven in the kitchen. We would turn it on and it would heat our apartment. And we would open up the uh, windows in the living room to release carbon monoxide. So I would say it was pretty poor. But early on, we learned about the relationship between energy or the lack thereof and public health, that if you don't get energy right, it's hard to get health right. And so that was a good lesson to learn early on. Well, yeah, it makes me think of uh, a lot of learning these days about how bad you know natural gas stoves are and indoor air quality a lot of new education about that these days then you attended an elite prep school and after college became a volunteer for the obama campaign rising up the ranks to become a field director in eight states then you went to business school and founded the company block power say more about your journey from community organizer to political organizer to founder of an energy startup what was the through line and driving motivation for you uh, I wanted to create jobs for low-income communities of color. When I was a kid, I was probably like six or seven, walking down the street to pick up my two-year-old sister with an older cousin. We saw two young men standing on the other side of the corner, and one of them pulled out a gun and shot the other one in the face. And that was obviously traumatic for a kid to see, for any kid to see. It was also like pretty terrible for both of the young men who were involved in that shooting. Obviously, one of them got shot in the face, but the other one, you know, shot someone, I mean, which is also traumatic and terrible. And so as I got older, you know, there were different layers of meaning to that incident. Eventually, you know, I had a fear of confrontation for a while. I didn't want to get into fist fights because I didn't want somebody to pull out a gun on me. But as I got older, it became clear. Everybody needed jobs. The shooter, the victim, both people needed to be employed outside the drug trade so that they wouldn't be involved in these violent escalations because it was a drug dispute, right? And so what were the things that we could do to create jobs? And when I went to college, I became a climate activist. My best friend in college is now a professor of public health at MIT. Mariana Arcaya, she took me to school on climate change. She just like beat it into me. She made me take classes. And so I learned about the climate crisis. And so for me, it was how do you fuse those two things? How do you create jobs and economic opportunity? And then how do you create jobs that are good for the environment that are in sustainability? And so whether it's as a community organizer or as a senior staffer in the Obama campaign, or a consultant to the Obama administration, and then ultimately at Block Power, I've been really focused on that intersection of like, how do you create jobs and wealth for historically disenfranchised communities 
then how do you do so in a way that reduces greenhouse gas emissions? And that's one of the reasons I'm such a fan of Sandra is because I think her work is, you know, she's working on the same thing in a different context, but same intersection. Fascinating story of a traumatic personal experience and fusing that with education into a career. Sandra Kwok, in fourth grade, you read a book, 50 Ways to Help the Earth, when you were attending a Montessori school. How did that book resonate with you? And then what did you do next? I could not believe that there was this thing called climate change at that time called global warming that people knew was happening and no one was doing anything about it. So I felt like Chicken Little running around my school <laughs> saying, hey, everybody, look, there are these greenhouse gas emissions that our buildings and cars are spewing into the atmosphere that are creating this heat envelope around the planet. Why are we not acting? And um, at that time, my little fourth grader image of a scientist was an old white man. And so I borrowed one of my dad's white shirts and I made this beard out of cotton balls and I gave a presentation <laughs> to my entire school about climate change. And it was really this formative moment for me. And it just struck me as crazy that this was in books and that people were not acting on it. And it really, I'm lucky that I found my life calling at an early age and that I had teachers who were putting resources like 50 Ways to Help the Earth in classrooms. And then later in your mid-20s, you founded a tank company and ran another one. That's quite a remarkable track record. So connect us there, that climate aha moment, that awakening in fourth grade with founding a couple and running companies in your 20s. Well, in undergrad, I was focused mostly on art and political activism. So using visual arts as a medium for communications. I was doing a lot of photography and running an underground arts organization, doing a lot of street murals, and feeling like the impact that I was having was more on a one-to-one -one basis and wanting to scale up my personal impact to have a larger societal reach. And so I sought out one of the few at the time green MBAs in the country. I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I sold all my things, rented a van, drove across the country to come out to San Francisco to get my green MBA. And while I was at Presidio, started looking at where the bulk of carbon dioxide emissions were coming from, which about one third of CO2 emissions in this country come from the built environment. Automobiles are about a quarter. And when you look within the built environment, where are their cost-effective means of reducing emissions? Energy efficiency seemed like an obvious choice. And so I, along with several of my colleagues at Presidio, launched an energy efficiency company for commercial buildings. While in grad school, <clears throat> we advanced in a couple of business competitions. We participated in the Clean Tech Open and worked on that for a few years. And then from there, I went into big data for the smart grid. So I started working for a Silicon Valley company called AutoGrid that is using information from smart meters and synthesizing it with big data algorithms to run energy efficiency and demand response as well as distributed resource and virtual power plant programs for utilities. So we were basically building apps that utilities would give for free to their customers and using big data to guarantee demand response for utilities. So as opposed to being this regulatory thing that the PUC was saying the utility has to do and the utility was only using their largest factories and commercial and industrial customers, we were enabling everyday consumers of electricity to participate in cost-saving programs. So we were actually running the largest demand response program for residential customers in the United States at Oklahoma Gas and Electric. So little grandmas were getting on TV saying, I saved $500 this summer and bought a ticket to go see my grandbabies. <laughs> and well, all of that was really exciting, being able to use technology to save megawatts of power at a time on the grid. I was still feeling that a lot of my social justice and activist leanings were not completely fulfilled. I had this desire to use all of this amazing cutting edge technology that we have in renewable energy and energy efficiency to actually tangibly improve people's lives on the front lines. And I was thinking back to a project that we did in school where we designed a microfinance model for organic farmers, collectives in Nicaragua to get access to solar power drip irrigation systems. So the initial CapEx was funded by a grant and the ongoing repayment of a zero interest loan fed a pool of capital that enabled people from the community to get solar on their homes. 
And that really had struck me in my life as one of the most meaningful projects I'd ever worked on. And that was the genesis of 10 Power. A Forbes column in 2019 noted that many investors have pledged to fund more women founders, but that has been a notable failure despite the awakening of the Me Too movement. Why aren't there more women founders of startup companies? There are a lot of women founders of startup companies, but the- Do they get the funding they need? We do not get the funding that we need. And you know what? Within venture capital, it's pretty miserable, hovering between 1% and 2%. And when you look at women of color-led companies, it's even more tragic. It's around 0.2% of total funding goes towards women of color-led companies. On the flip side, women of color-led companies are some of the fastest growing job creators in our economy. And so I think it's really a big missed opportunity for the economy right now, especially as we're trying to bounce back from the pandemic. We really need to see more investment in people of color led, BIPOC led companies, women led companies. And the more equity that you're investing in society, the more justice and equity that you're going to see being grown by BIPOC and women led business leaders within their communities. Donald Baird, how many investors turned you down? And what was your experience as a black founder in the sort of tech bro world? Let me circle back to that. I want to add quickly to Sandra's point. The New York Federal Reserve Bank did a study of which businesses created local jobs and maximized economic recovery after the 2009 financial collapse. And it was local woman-led e-commerce businesses, non-venture-backable local digital small businesses that sell you know, cakes or toys or whatever it is. These were the, the businesses that correlated with economic recovery across America. In any county in the country where you had a group of these businesses, that county was able to recover. In counties where you did not have digital businesses led by women, led by women of color, the recovery, the economic recovery in that county was slowed. So I just think that what Sandra's saying is like incredibly important and just want to highlight it. It's not that we're asking people to invest in women founders because it's fair and because it's moral and ethical, even though it is, it is like the best thing for our economy and is the best thing for our economic recovery. And so if you respond to that kind of argument, like then take that and go do it. At Block Power, we spoke to over 200 investors, venture capital investors, but really impact investors. Sandra, I don't remember what your journey was like, but Mine was horrible. It's terrible. I don't pull any punches about it. I try not to like mention the investor's name when I throw them under the bus, but we had terrible experiences, just atrocious behavior. We signed agreements with impact investors. They changed the agreement at the last moment. They made secret changes to screw us and didn't warn us or tell us. When we asked questions, they threatened to withdraw the entire deal. Just atrocious behavior from impact investors. And, and let me um, just jump in here and say the impact investors are investors who are intentionally not seeking maximum dollar. They're seeking profit and social change. So you're saying that the social change, quote, you know, more enlightened capitalist investors were the ones who were treating you that way. Oh, they're barbarians. I mean, they're cave people. I mean, they're Neanderthals. I just, <laughs> Going around saying you know, we're social do-gooders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, the, like, they're the do-gooder capitalists. Yeah, it's like marketing. I'm sure they feel very good about themselves because they're doing well, quote unquote, but they're not, right? They're not investing in companies, actually, not in a significant way. We were treated much, much better by traditional private sector venture capitalists in Silicon Valley than we were by impact investors. And the financial returns that the impact investors were looking for were, in many cases, they were higher than what the pure for-profit investors had. So I remember talking to a prominent impact investor about a debt note, and I was like, well, what interest rate are you going to charge me for this debt? And he was like, I'm going to charge you 17%. 17%? on debt? Is this a credit card? Is this usury? Like, what are we, what are we doing here? I know you want to save the planet and make a social impact, but charging people 17% is not the way to do it. But I do think there are lessons to be learned for traditional venture capitalists who, as we've talked about, struggle to invest in women, struggle to invest in people of color, less than 3% overall. I think there's lessons to be learned for climate philanthropists who are even worse 
than the traditional investors. A lower percentage of climate philanthropy goes to people of color than venture investment goes to people of color. So the climate philanthropists who are giving away money, they're not even pretending to invest it. They're giving it away in grants. They can't find a way to give more capital to people of color than Silicon Valley invests in people of color. Well, climate philanthropy is dominated by, you know, Steyer, Bloomberg is a bunch of billionaire white men that really drive climate philanthropy in terms of the number of dollars moved. So the ultra high net worth people that you name, they actually do pretty decent on some of the race stuff. So I think if you look at Steyer's portfolio, if you look at Bloomberg's portfolio, they do great. I think when you look at family offices or family foundations or local community foundations, that's where you see people really struggling to move capital to underserved minorities and women. And the problem is, again, it's not just unethical. It's like, we're not going to win. I mean, we just, we're not going to have the political coalition that we need to be successful. Edgar Villanueva um, in Decolonize Wealth hit the nail on the head in terms of philanthropy and equity. And what was the basic thesis there? The, a lot of the same institutional biases that exist within our economic structures are also the lens that philanthropy is distributed through. And especially within family offices, you have small teams distributing large amounts of capital. And so it tends to go to the same old players. And so we're actually seeing a lot of perpetuation of racism, especially when you have the white savior complex working in communities of color and philanthropy can be very detrimental to continuing this perpetuation of the same types of colonization and institutionalized racism. So in order to flip this, what we really need to do is provide those concessionary dollars to people from the communities that they're working in and to really empower business leaders and nonprofit leaders who are closest to the issues that they're dealing with and take off those bias glasses when allocating capital. You're listening to a conversation on the next steps in the transition away from fossil fuels and who will be included. This is Climate One. Coming up, how President Joe Biden can deliver on some unfulfilled promises made by Barack Obama. I'm delighted about what I'm seeing from the Biden-Harris team. Climate justice and racial equality are wedded together alongside employment, alongside public health and working our way out of these kind of four simultaneous crises we're dealing with. The devil's in the details of implementation. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. We're talking about an inclusive energy transition with Sandra Kwok, CEO and founder of 10 Power, and Donnell Baird, founder and CEO of Block Power. Baird was an early organizer with Barack Obama's presidential campaign back in 2007. He says Joe Biden is coming into the presidency under very different conditions. Obama was constrained in ways that Biden was not, is not. How so? Because a white guy can has more latitude? Obama had to be really careful because he was the first black president? In part. I mean, I was a senior staffer for Obama. I left Brooklyn and packed up my car and drove down to rural South Carolina to join the campaign. I had thought that it would be good for all the kids in the neighborhood where I was a community organizer to see a first black vice presidential nominee. And I thought that if we could win the South Carolina primary, then Obama could be like Hillary's vice president. And that would be like good for black children to look up to him and see that. And so, so you thought of Obama as the number two on the ticket. Yeah, yeah. Which goes to show you, even in someone who is focused on black empowerment, even I at the beginning of the campaign didn't think it was possible for him to win. And so now we kind of take it for granted. But that was just a monumental achievement on his part. It wasn't the campaign. It was. It was on the part of him as a candidate who, you know, like Sandra, you know, someone with a multiracial background who also was able to speak 
to people in all different corners, all different ethnicities and nationalities, and kind of build a common framework and language and movement, and then turn that into a fist that we could impose on people, you know, these disparate fingers and unite them into a fist that we could impose on the Democratic Party and then the Republican Party to win the presidency. I remember when we selected Joe Biden, it was a strength that Joe Biden has a history of opposing people of color in public schools. It is a strength that he comes out of white working class backgrounds that early in the primaries, he said that Obama was like articulate and clean and bright, which Al Sharpton, who had also run for president, was rightfully really offended. He was like, Joe, what are you saying? You're saying that I'm dirty. I'm not bright. I'm not articulate. Al Sharpton was rightfully offended by some of the comments that Biden made in the primary where he was running against Obama. So it was a strength that Joe Biden identified and was identifiable with certain parts of the country that are, I'm going to say, on a learning journey about racial equality, right, and racial justice. And so that does allow him more latitude to communicate with different parts of the country. He's credible with them in a way that it's really difficult for Obama to do. And then some of it, and I'll get in trouble for this, some of it has to do with the political nature of Obama. Obama is a conservative institutionalist, which he himself will tell you. And so some of the more radical, if you will, elements of what needed to happen in terms of racial justice, certainly in terms of climate justice, certainly in terms of climate mitigation, I believe no one loves Barack Obama more than me, but I wish that we could have gone back and been much more aggressive in many, many areas much, much earlier on. And I do think when we're looking back 20, 50 years from now, there's going to be a question around, could we have gotten more done earlier on in the first and second Obama terms than we did? And would that have been the correct move for the entire human race relative to some of the policy priorities that we had at the time? That said, I'm delighted about what I'm seeing from the Biden-Harris team. Climate justice and racial equality are wedded together alongside employment, alongside public health and working our way out of these kind of four simultaneous crises we're dealing with. And so I'm really excited when I'm seeing about the Biden-Harris in terms of their public policy positions. The devil's in the details of implementation. Can we get this through the Senate? And if we can get it through the Senate, how do we implement it on the ground? How do we create jobs, lower the cost of equipment so that clean energy is not only more accessible in America, but also in Haiti, right? Where 10 powers focus and around the world. For sure. I think Kamala Harris is also a huge inspiration. You know, the way that Obama the way that kids can imagine themselves, you know, in the White House from all different races and backgrounds, I think for both diversity as well as gender, Kamala Harris is a huge inspiration. And I'm so thrilled to see the diversity of folks in the cabinet. We're for the first time seeing a lot of Native American leaders, Indigenous women, specifically new positions, Gina McCarthy in charge of climate. It's really heartening to see that policy is aligning with a lot of the impact initiatives that we in the trenches of social enterprise have been working on for a long time. Ten Power is looking right now at um, potentially expanding to work with tribes stateside. So I'm really excited to see a lot of the um, potential subsidies coming through the DOE to level the playing field. It is insane when you look at energy inequity within our own communities. You know, Donnell, you firsthand experience with us when you go to a lot of reservations, there's still not running water. A lot of places in the rural south don't have adequate sanitation, let alone reliable electricity. So really turning an eye domestically to um, how we can create more energy access and energy equity. It's really important that we provide the appropriate financing mechanisms because the grid that, you know, a lot of us in cities enjoy was heavily subsidized, you know, was a very low cost, long-term bonds. And that type of capital doesn't necessarily exist right now for marginalized communities. So it's important that we create blended capital stacks and that there's also government capital that's available to really bring us all up to the same level. Indigenous populations in America certainly need a ton of support. You know, I serve on the board of Sierra Club Foundation, 
we recently made an investment to create one of the largest wind turbine plants that would be owned and operated and maintained by native communities in the American Midwest. Those are the kinds of things that we really need impact investors, as well as the government, as well as climate philanthropists, to collaborate, to create, you know, if there aren't long-term bonds like there used to be, well, then we need to create some climate bonds, right, that are going to allow us to finance this clean energy infrastructure in the communities that we care about, vulnerable, historically disenfranchised communities. And these communities need to own the climate infrastructure that gets installed in their communities. Not only do they get the jobs, not only do they get the financial returns, but they need to have ownership stakes in this infrastructure as it rolls out. It's an irony that the Navajo Nation had a huge coal-fired power plant on their land and that yet there was energy poverty all around that huge generating station that sent power to Los Angeles, but people in the shadow of that coal-fired power plant didn't have power. Donald Baird, you worked on green jobs as an organizer for a confederation of labor unions representing 5 million people across the country, yet green jobs never realized their promise, and now President Biden is putting jobs at the center of his climate efforts. Will green jobs materialize this time? Green jobs will materialize this time. I think what we didn't have last time that we have this time around, we didn't have a cohort of incredible leaders like Sandra, we only had idiots like me who were cutting our teeth for the first time. And just, I mean, I didn't have a, an MBA from an all sustainability program that could prepare. Like we just, we didn't. So it does matter that we have a new cohort of leaders who over the last 10 years have emerged. It does matter that there have been innovations in software. The cost of machine learning has plummeted. The cost of cloud computing has plummeted. I got my first iPhone in 2007. Now everybody has an iPhone. And so we can have native populations going building to building and taking photos and videos and filling out survey about how much lead and asbestos and air pollution is going on in their buildings and in their homes. They can measure that with their smartphone. They can report that to us and we can train people on how to upgrade and fix their own buildings and own community through apps, through people's smartphones, which everybody have. So the collapse in a cost of a lot of the computational capacity that's available now that was not available to the Obama team 10 years ago is necessary as a prerequisite to unlock the possibilities of green jobs. I would just add to that quickly to put a finer point on it. I worked for a coalition of labor unions. We had $90 billion, with a B, $90 billion that we wanted to use to invest in green jobs and energy efficiency across the country. Native populations, in the urban populations, in rural populations, we were going to co-invest with Citibank and Barclays to structure green bonds, and we were going to train and hire workers across the country to go building to building and green all the buildings. We were not able to achieve that during the Obama administration. We were able to achieve a lot. We got Tesla and Solar City and a lot of other stuff going. We were not able to achieve building to building green buildings projects with a million good paying jobs. And I do think that we're going to be able to achieve that under the Biden Harris team because there's been a lot of lessons that we've learned over the last 10 years and the cost of software and data will allow us to access and analyze these projects in a way that we couldn't 10 years ago and again a cohort of you know a new generation of leaders that understand finance that know how to be creative are going to allow us to deploy capital into these communities to create these jobs so that is my expectation we fully intend to deliver on this promise Sandra Kwok, 10 Power is a B Corporation. What does that mean for people who are not familiar with that term? And and how is a B Corp different than a regular corporation? I know Patagonia is a B Corp. Yeah, and you're fully committed in your bylaws to upholding human welfare and environmental best practices equal to your fiduciary responsibility. So fully embracing the triple bottom line of people and planet equivalent to profit. 
So in the case of most traditional companies, fiduciary responsibility is the one and only bottom line. Whereas with a B Corp, you have equal responsibility to your stakeholders, to your employees, to the constituents that you serve, and to the environment and the resources that you are using and that you may be impacting with externalities. And um, we actually were named a best in the world environmental B Corp in 2019 which was a surprise as a small company. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a big deal because regular companies that don't maximize their profits can be sued for not doing that. And B Corps, you know, that's a different legal situation. Uh, Donnell Baird, you are active looking at Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Chicago, cities that have regulations supporting moving away from fossil fuels. How do you plan to green the buildings in those cities? Well, we're already doing it. We're greening them. We have projects in Philly, Chicago, Milwaukee. We're helping a pastor in Milwaukee today reduce his fossil fuel consumption. And part of what we've done is we've built digital models of buildings all over the country. We run physics-based thermodynamic models of energy waste and fossil fuel waste in the buildings. And then we can recommend the kind of green energy equipment upgrades that make sense for each and every building. And so we can do that for a couple million buildings across New York State and hopefully soon, knock on wood, 100 million buildings across America. And so by providing the energy efficiency or electrification or solar recommendations of the size and type of equipment that are appropriate to each and every building. We make it easy for the building owner to decide to kind of move forward with a project because they know what a green project would look like. They know what the return on investment would be, what a projected cost would look like. And then we provide a full stack turnkey service to the building owner so they don't have to navigate six, seven, eight, nine different engineer, architect, lenders, construction firms who all disagree with one another, we streamline it and make it easy for people. And then last, we finance the projects. And so we recently closed a $55, $56 million facility led by Goldman Sachs and other investors who are focused on providing capital to clean energy infrastructure in urban buildings. And so we know that many buildings across the country. Look, we got 30 million unemployed Americans, right? Like they need capital in order to convert to solar. They want to convert to solar. They want to save money. They've learned about what it means to be green over the last 10 years to have a green and healthy building, but they still need capital, right? And they need to be able to borrow it or lease it or what have you. And so we have a credit line that allows us to finance these projects for folks. Well, as we get to the end here, I just want to ask one question to bring it home. Uh, Donnell Baird, heat pumps are one way that homeowners can move toward cleaner power. We're hearing a lot about heat pumps these days. Briefly explain for us what a heat pump is and what kind of homeowner out there listening to this could consider replacing fossil fuel. So what is a heat pump and what kind of homeowners should consider moving their heating to one? So we think heat pumps allow you to turn a building into a Tesla. And what do we mean by that? Tesla is taking the fossil fuel equipment out of the automobile and replacing it with all electric equipment, all electric engine. Buildings use oil, they use gas, other fossil fuels to provide heating, cooling, and hot water on a daily basis in buildings all over the country. A heat pump allows you to take that fossil fuel equipment out of the building and replace it with smart, healthy, green, 100% electric equipment for heating, for cooling, for hot water. You're turning that building into a Tesla. You're making it awesome. And we finance and install those for people. And effectively, you're decarbonizing the building. You can reduce that greenhouse gas emissions, that carbon footprint in that building by 70% when you put in a heat pump. Heat pumps have a terrible name. They should have been called like clean heat or green heat or, you know, no one knows what a heat pump is and it's not sexy, but we're trying to make people understand that if you care about climate change and climate mitigation and job creation, a heat pump is one of the sexiest things out there because this is the way, this is the silver bullet to help us address the four crises that our country faces. We got a jobs crisis, we got a racial justice crisis, we got a pandemic, right? And of course, the climate crisis. And so by installing heat pumps at scale in 100 million American buildings, the heat pumps actually have UV light inside them. And so when they suck in air, they can actually clean the air of COVID-19. So you're creating jobs, 
you're reducing the spread of COVID-19 and other viruses. You can build up wealth in communities that have been disenfranchised when you can allow them to co-own and install these systems. And of course, you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 70%. And buildings are 30% of the United States greenhouse gas footprint. So we think this is a magic bullet, and we're excited to try and get to work on this. We've been talking about how to make an inclusive transition away from fossil fuels with Sandra Kwok, CEO and founder of Ten Power, and Donnell Baird, the CEO and founder of Block Power. And earlier in the show, Andreas Karelis, author of Climate Courage, How Tackling Climate Change Can Build Community, Transform the Economy, and Bridge the Political Divide in America. To hear more Climate One conversations, subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the climate conversation. Sarah Catherine Coxon is our senior producer, and our producer is Tyler Reed. Kelly Pennington directs our audience engagement. Steve Fox is director of advancement. Our audio team is Mark Kirshner, Arnav Gupta, and Andrew Stelzer. Dr. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.